So, greetings, everyone. We are from Ukraine, and we are in Ukraine, we are from Ukraine. So, Your Excellency, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador, dear friends, friends to Ukraine Catholic University, all those here with us in the audience and in this room, as well as those listening to us online. The Ukraine Catholic University is uh, just as many other universities and many other institutions is facing those horrible events uh, uh, in, in Ukraine. But on the other hand, every time we want to be at the front, and as you've already feel, felt this, we want to have this just a bit of humor in order to be able to survive this, to, to overcome this, to do everything possible in order to become a warriors at all the front lines. The, the greatest success of ours over the previous time is that we've managed to to have an offline educational process so that the students were with us. And uh, under current conditions, this is a, a truly an exceptional case, an exceptional possibility, but we clearly understand that both the parents and the students are expecting to have the real education. And the education is real only when we are all together. And we have a clear mission, that is to be together, to educate, to teach our students to love one another and to give hope to one another. So today we have our wonderful speakers, professors, and they will have a very good discussion for all of us. We have a lot of questions. In fact, we have more questions to those in control of our country for those helping or assisting us, and everyone is facing these thoughts. Why do we receive some information too late? Why do we receive some weapons too late? Why do we have so small amounts of these or that weapons? And there's so many questions why, and hopefully there will be more answers than the questions. So, with God's help, let us have a wonderful and fruitful discussion, and let us all start our program. So, greetings. Uh, well, the Dean had to introduce me, but let me do that myself. So, good afternoon. Uh, you know, we kept saying that it's good evening, but it's still a day. My name is Sofia Opatska the uh, Deputy Dean of the Ukrainian Catholic University. I'm the founder of the Business School at the Ukrainian Catholic University, and I have a uh, an honor to moderate this discussion. Everyone who needs a translation into English received hand, head, uh, headphones. So if you did not, please raise your hand and we will do it. So hopefully everyone has received these uh, uh, possibilities for translation. If not, please do so. Just to remind you, anyone needs an interpretation into English, please uh, say so. So it's an honor for me to, to introduce the uh, panelists. Uh, and today we'll be talking about the keys to transformation. Let me introduce the panelists and you please support them because they are also so kind of a bit worried. So let me first introduce Yaroslav Rutsak, a professor, a PhD in history, a public person. So everyone, please take your seats and I'll take my seat as well. So now, please uh, welcome Miroslav Maranovich. Uh, he's uh, responsible for the mission of the Ukrainian Catholic University, so please pick the seats. Uh, and uh, just wanted to say that Miroslav is not only the deputy dean on the mission, which is a fairly kind of a unique position, but he's also a Ukrainian uh, lawyer and founder of Ukrainian housing group political also dissident. I don't know if you were, if you've been proud of that, but you have to be. Well, a former political, uh, political prisoner, in fact. So, I, I, I knew that I will say something wrong. And uh, 
Hopefully, it happened sooner than the later, so I can talk normally later on. So let me introduce Katerina Zahori, the co-founder of the uh, Zahori Foundation, our senator and Ukrainian media expert and the patron, and also Roman Kachur, a psychiatrist, a pre president of Ukrainian uh, Federation of uh, Psychologists and Psychiatrists, uh, and uh, then also a head of the department at the Ukrainian Catholic University. So please, Roman, please join us and take your seats. Okay, hopefully you've remembered who's who, and I'd like to congratulate not only those of our uh, audience members uh, who've gathered here today, so thank you for coming offline, but it also words of greetings to those joining us online. It's great to have solidarity among the people of, from the whole world, because whenever we get a matter, a ma or a message or a letter, either on the messenger or on the SMS message, like, how are you? Can we help in some ways? And of course, we've appreciated all those messages. So big greetings to all of us uh, and all the audience online. Andrei Kurochka has already mentioned how can you support us uh, online and I'll remind you later on. So let's have our conversation in the following way. I will start the the, the debate. I can't call you really a guest because, you know, you're all sort of good friends of us. We're all the same. We're all so close. Just, okay, just hopefully it wasn't the case that no, no, somebody can't hear you, because sometimes you start talking and people say, well, we haven't heard you. So going back to what I've tried to say, we'll have the following conversation. I will start our conversation, this sort of debate, and then uh, we'll have some questions from the audience. And there could be provocative questions, painful questions, Maybe some questions with home, but we don't want to have some extraordinary questions, and uh, we want to, sp uh, to to discuss about those most painful issues that we face. So we need to search for hope. We need to search for the hope of the future, as we all need this hope. So let's start with this introductory question that I keep hearing from my friends, relatives, uh, those I know, those I don't know, partners from abroad, they, you know, they keep asking me, okay, what would the victory mean for Ukrainians? What What is your understanding with the, of the victory? Because we try to make this victory closer, but what is the meaning of this victory for you, for those people close to you? Why not starting with this question? So, Professor Hritsak, you have a first chance to answer this question. Um, now, what is the victory for me? Well, minimum is to have uh, our forces at the borders of 1991 and this liberation of all the territories. But this is the minimum because this is the absolute necessity. But it's not enough, because if we'll get to the borders, or in fact, when we'll get to the borders of 1991, then the West could say, okay, you did a good job, nobody expected, but you've done this, you're heroes. But then let us start conversations with Moscow and without you. So that's a conditional, it's a possible situation, but we cannot avoid, we cannot exclude this. Why am I afraid? Because then we have a scenario of 1991, because Russia is left alone, and hopefully it will change, it will be a wealthy country, but then in the end there will be a new Putin. That's a new, not a new scenario, but that's a scenario that we had for the Russia over the past hundred years, because Russia had some periods of good reforms, this intention to become a normal European country. Alexander the first, Alexander the second, seven months of temporary council, even this uh, reforms of uh, Horbachev, Yeltsin. The problem is that after this short period of normalization, there's another bloody stage of repressions, which uh, ends up in a military aggression. So if that mechanism will not be stopped, that 
uh, if we'll get to the borders of 1991, then of course we cannot preclude, and this is, I'm saying as a historian, that this, this war will be continued by our grandsons or sons. Because Russia would never change. That's why, for me, the key condition is the radical change of Russia. Let me point your attention to the fact that two weeks ago there was Sevalet Nevesemtsev's article in a New Europe newspaper and he speaks straight straightforward. Russia would never change itself. Forget about this. It's too late. Russia would only change when you deprive it of sovereignty, not only the external um, um, attack, but dictating it what needs to be done, involving the European Union and NATO, uh, the sovereignty should be uh, should be taken away from it, especially the control of the red button, so that the gangsters would not be deciding the future of the world. Demilitarization becomes one of the aspects. Uh, now, what is the involvement of Ukraine here? Mr. Gritsak, uh, we will get to that topic and I have some follow-up questions already, but first I would like to share the floor with the other keynote speakers so that everyone would speak about what uh, war means to you. So, Miroslav, back to you. Can you hear me? Okay. To a certain extent, we have already achieved a very important element of the victory, namely, we be believe in our victory already. Uh, socializing and networking here, I talked to uh, His Excellency uh, Apostle uh, Nunzi, and he said that he hasn't met a single per person in Ukraine who wouldn't believe in our victory. And this is an import, a very important um, element of our joint future. The second element is this. I support what Yaroslav just mentioned. It's not enough for me to return to the national borders uh, circa 1991, because if we return to them uh, as we were before this war, then that would be our defeat, actually. We need to change, and as the foundation for such changes, as a model of such changes, I would probably quote uh, Saint Tertullian, the blood uh, of those who hurt is the seed of the future. Uh, in other words, the blood of uh, today's uh, martyrs of this war would be the seeds of the future Ukraine. Uh, the, the country that would be responsible for its fate and will join the family of uh, uh, international community and would become an important element of it. Thank you. Katya, what does victory mean to you? And I know that you talk a lot recently with uh, simple people, uh, ordinary people at the deoccupied territories, probably you know what the victory means to them as well. Well, then these would be two uh, uh, opposite answers. For me, the victory and everyone whom I mention it to argues with me. For me, the victory uh, uh, means reparations. That means that all the countries around us um, persecuted Russia for what they, uh, Russia did, reparations, not only returning back uh, within the national borders and stopping military actions, but that Russia has been persecuted and that it's being forced to start paying reparations. And I want it to happen in our lifetime, uh, because under all the other scenarios, my uh, kid uh, grew up and when they ask me why my 12-year-old boy is so militarized and knows about weapons better than some of the adults because, I say, uh, most of his life he spent uh, in the time of war, so that uh, nothing like that would happen to him, to my grandchildren, to uh, others. Russia has to be persecuted. If you have any other way of suggesting how we would understand that Russia was persecuted, well, suggest it to me then. 
uh, people uh, I talk to and I, I love talking and the fact that I'm uh, a keynote speaker on the intellectual discussion um, with the keyword intellectual speaks for itself. So. Uh, speaking to the people who uh, deoccupied villages and uh, uh, frontline uh, villages have the same mood. Some had lots of Russians in them, others had Russian troops passing through them. So people there uh, talk only about ceasefire and to tomorrow, that tomorrow we know that what needs to be done. We wait for tomorrow to come and that we will have this tomorrow. Tomorrow will be New Year, tomorrow our kids will go to school. So this um, uh, feeling of tomorrow, not only of today which is over, well, uh, for me, this tomorrow uh, is reparations. Uh, thank you. And uh, now, uh, Mr. Roman, uh, what victory means to you and to people you talk to? Hello, colleagues. I would probably have a more modest assumption of victory because my expectation of the victory is that Ukraine will join the Western world. I believe demanding from the world or from the history that we would completely defeat Russia? Well, I don't know. I cannot make such a statement myself. I believe our victory and our tomorrow uh, would emerge when the safety and security would come. And the safety and security uh, would uh, only emerge in the world that is based on the ethics and that is safe, that is well protected. The world that is uh, uh, based on the rules. And only then, I believe, uh, the needed precondition for our development would arise. The development is possible when the security is ensured and the security and safety uh, would happen only if we join the structures of the Western world. I don't know uh, which borders we would have. Uh, I cannot expect anything like that, but what we need to recognize is that uh, the war has started. We are in the time of war. There is certain wartime ethics, but the war will end uh, at some point of time. We will end this war, and I believe this war will end when we join the Western world and when the uh, eastern borders of Ukraine would become eastern borders of the Western world. Then uh, our victory would come. Thank you. you you probably all also thought to yourselves what victory means to you, because this is the question that uh, requires an answer. Our um, discussion here is named uh, Keys to the Transformations. The Metropolitan Sheptetsky said that the key to transforming Ukraine is inside it. Uh, it's tough for us to change the external circumstances, but it's within our will uh, to uh, change ourselves. And this quote from Metropolitan uh, Sheptetsky uh, is quite straightforward, but this task of changing yourself and through transforming yourself uh, uh, help to transform the country, well, it's uh, actually more complicated than it sounds. So we have this uh, feeling of changes, but there are uh, diverse opinions on many things. Uh, in abundance as well. And uh, my follow-up question to you would be this. We have already started talking about this. Which changes you observe in the society? Which changes bring the victory closer? And which changes uh, take the victory away from us? And depending on our mood, we want to see more of one set of changes and less of the other. So what sort of changes do you see? So Mr. Miroslav, let's start with you now. Thank you. What I can observe now is how Ukraine uh, transforms its historical fatums into historical uh, chances. And this pleases me a lot. Let me illustrate it with three examples. The first example, the regional uh, differences, our uh, lifelong fatum. We failed to uh, apply the formula of unity, which could be understood as homogeneity, unification, 
uh, sameness. You know, uh, Edith uh, uh, Piecha song become uh, what I want you to be. We have been singing it along uh, this song and tried to demand that others will uh, change to please us. But it's no longer uh, uh, truth. Uh, our Maidans have created unity in diversity, and it's quite natural for for us now. This is what made uh, what pleased me at Maidan, at Maidan's times, and in the time of war. It's something that cancels all our previous fatums. Uh, the second issue might be uh, quite unexpected to some of you, but our historical fatum. Uh, was uh, Ottoman rule. That's what uh, Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky was talking about. Uh, inability to stay within the vertical structure or unwillingness to do to stay there, the, but we uh, are willing to make our own decisions uh, at the managerial level, but uh, at lower tier uh, there. So look at how the armed forces of Ukraine operate right now. It's delegating the decision-making to the lower tiers, and it works. Uh, now uh, it's called NATO model. It provides uh, flexibility to the system. What used to be our fatum turned to our great victory. The armed forces of Ukraine feel quite well under such model, and Russia uh, can not uh, understand this because uh, it's uh, not natural to them. And what we are lacking completely, and because this is not only the responsibility of Ukraine but the responsibility of the whole world, we are observing how autocracies and Russia is ahead of the herd here. They want to open the new history of. Um, being superior, offering uh, violence as the only tool to resolve all the outstanding problems. And for Russia, this is quite natural, uh, using violence as the main tool of governance, uh, governing the state, and uh, as they propose uh, to govern the whole world. So for Ukraine, the main idea used to be the idea of fairness, not violence, but fairness. And we st let's stick to this. Uh, this is our nature. And I'm convinced that not the atrocities, but the fairness and love are the future of this world. Thank you. Mr. Miroslav, uh, you always surprised me how with your uh, background you can still remember about love and demonstrate that love and talk about this love uh, candidly and openly. If, if it's okay with you, one more uh, comment from me. I visited Prague recently where we, they celebrated their own revolution and the motto of Prague Revolution, uh, Velvet's Revolution, was uh, truth and love. And it's beautiful. That uh, speaks to us, to our nature. That's what will uh, help us to win. I can. Uh, I look at Professor Gritsak and I can see that he disagrees with you. He wants to talk about Russia, how to change Russia. Uh, wait a second. Wait a second. I promised I would not talk about Russia. No, you can because it's a, of no interest. Just, well, no. Uh, we just touched uh, that. I, I, uh, please allow me to answer the, uh, your question. Unlike Miroslav, and probably there is a semantic difference, and uh, uh, I don't believe in the uh, the fact that the key to trans uh, transforming, that we are able to transform ourselves. I'm a Christian, and it's tough to play the role of uh, the devil's advocate in the Catholic uh, University. Well, you quoted uh, Metropolitan Sheptitsky, but let me tell you as a historian why I don't believe in, in this, because the key to changes are institutions. First and foremost, institutions, those who go to church, uh, those who pray uh, before uh, um, commune, commune uh, ceremony, well, uh, the institutions could be found in uh, good 
or in bad institutions. I don't believe that uh, the institutions are only bad. Uh, the problem of uh, Russia is that they cannot resolve the issue of governance for 500 years. But my idea is this. I believe that Ukraine came very close to resolve all our uh, uh, existential problems. By default, I believe that Ukraine is already in the Western world, but almost there. Almost uh, doesn't count because it's not enough. In order to be fully there, we need to carry out three reforms. The first reform is to create in independent courts. Uh, courts, uh, the judicial uh, reform, this is Kwanon. Without this, nothing would happen, full stop. However kind we are, if we don't have independent courts of law, well, uh, you are uh, from business. I know also, like you know, what it would lead to. Second thing, the level of development of each society uh, depends on the status of two professional occupations, uh, medical doctor and teachers. Uh, as to the hospitals, we seem to have a, uh, a success story, and of course, uh, medical experts should speak uh, here, but I'm not even talking about the army here because it's uh, uh, understood uh, by default. But uh, uh, the second pre uh, re uh, precondition is the reform of education educational system, and I'm uh, candid here. I don't believe that the Ministry of Education could reform itself when the minister is the person who has been caught in plagiarism, and he wouldn't uh, be the student of our university. Well, he would uh, not even finish the first semester, Yeah, and he uh, could not handle the reforms. And here I agree with Miroslav, like I said, we should have non-state universities, uh, uh, fully autonomous, like independent courts and autonomous universities that have a space of freedom. But this is important. And to expect that the ministry will handle it, well, not the ministry that we have now. Why UKU is great? Why the Kiev Magilla Academy is great? Because the uh, imp uh, impact of the government is small. Kaha Benukidze said that if you don't want to uh, if you don't want to have apples in your country create the ministry of uh, apple trees uh, so let the universities uh, rule those transformations and my idea is quite uh, simple and i have changed it when talking to the journalist oh sh she's here uh, be be because before talking to her i dreamt of uh, opening a uh, catholic university in odessa uh, such universities as uku and kiev Magill Academy should be in each metropolitan city, uh, Lviv, Kyiv, Odessa, Kharkiv, Dnipro. As to Donetsk, well, let's not talk about it right now. So uh, I dreamt that the uh, Catholic University would uh, be opened in Odessa, but now I changed my mind to the Ukrainian Catholic University in Sebastopol. Wow, that's quite uh, a relevant topic to plot to, but I still wanted to ask you about Russia. Can I do that, please? Uh, yeah, uh, my question is this, because uh, I am concerned with this issue and being moderator, I have the right to ask my questions. And what I'm concerned about is that uh, another another Russia would not be of interest to the Western world. Uh, yes and no, because it, it, it's be, uh, people are afraid of it. I believe in the time of war, radical changes have happened, uh, and I can illustrate it with the example of Russia. Uh, uh, when they claim that Russia would not uh, survive for three hours, but now Scholz almost uh, tells the same thing as uh, uh, Scholz is saying, too late, but still it's happened. The problem of Russia is that it cannot uh, uh, reform itself, and uh, uh, it's Ukraine that should reform Russia as a winner in this war uh, for two simple reasons, because the West, uh, as, uh, in particular uh, Biden and the U.S., at least that's what I was told, Biden didn't uh, believe that uh, Ukraine will give up, but he believed that the government will give up and would not function, but Ukraine will keep fighting, and then the job of uh, uh, the U.S. would be to help this guerrilla or 
warfare uh, for a long time to topple that uh, uh, empire. So uh, Ukraine's role was uh, uh, the piece of cheese in the mousetrap, and Ukraine demonstrated what we can uh, deliver, even uh, not being that strong. So first thing, Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's voice should be heard in those negotiations with Russia, and uh, uh, Russia, uh, and we need to clearly say what are the contours of our victory. Uh, we earned that. And second thing I believe is that after this war, everybody would understand that Ukrainians are the best experts on Russia. Uh, only Ukraine knows what Ukraine can do. Uh, so I'm, I'm not interested what will happen with Russia. Uh, but what I'm interested in, what we're going to do after the victory. And we need to start describing and discussing uh, this and uh, properly articulate the contours of our victory. And it's probably uh, already too late, but we need to do this because the victory is coming. We don't know when, but uh, every day brings us closer to the victory. Well, thank you. Thank you, Katya. What about your viewpoints on the changes in these areas where you work for? I mean, the changes which are bringing us closer uh, to the victory. Well, this is just these changes that we've already mentioned, these institutions that are not working. Because well, in Kiev, I thought that they are working, these institutions are working, some institutions working better, some not. But now, facing all those challenges that we all have in the so, deoccupied uh, villages. Uh, this is particularly the case because not a single institution is working. So, using this opportunity to call to governors, deputy governors, different ministries. Sometimes I face better people who, well, and then they offer some support and, and assistance, but the institutions cannot support. In some cases, the hospitals are not working. The, the doctors may be doing something, may be trying to uh, help travel around the country and offer the assistance. There are people offering some local support. Uh, and what I was impressed is this laugh to one another and the feeling of self-support. Because there's no community, the community is not working like a village council. But then there is this feeling of uh, uh, mutual support. And this is something we've shared uh, this impressions with one another. So whenever there is a, a church in, in a village, and it doesn't matter which church, it just it stays there. Or there is a cultural house or some something similar to that. It could be, you know, a cafe or something or a small restaurant where people are gathering when there is no communications, no electricity, no gas supply, no water supply. But people were gathering in this area and helping one another. So we have to recognize that those institutions are not working. We need to reform them and then to select an area in which we do have an expertise So and, and start working on this area, on changing this area. So um, judicial reform is something that is very crucial. We have a lot of uh, lawyers and barristers, international recognized barristers. So we have a lot of them sitting in this room. So why don't you rise and, and start dealing that, with that? So let us all join and cover those loopholes, those gaps that are all over there. Because without institutions, we will be able to help on these several uh, people, but not to be able to transform into an effective and efficient uh, state. A state with Ukrainian, with Ukrainian language is widely spoken, particularly in the southern villages. When we, you can understand that it's it's hard for the people to to speak Ukrainian, but still they're trying, they're intending to do so. So we need to do something more than we had to. Those who know how to earn money, surely. You have the expertise, you have the knowledges. So let us just spend this, let us use this expertise and whenever we have a spare time for the better of all Ukrainians. So a number of uh, things that I would like to compliment. When the full-scale aggression started, and in fact, there wasn't too many institutions who got trusted. 
in somewhere outside of Ukraine. Unfortunately, Ukraine Catholic University is, is an institution that is well trusted around the world. So we have a lot of projects, but we don't have enough institutions. So I absolutely agree that we have to develop those institutions and to cover those loopholes, those gaps in, in the roof. Well, that's a temporary solution, but we need to think maybe we need to remodel that roof. Maybe we need to reconstruct the roof completely. And this is something that we keep hearing from our Western counterparts. They keep saying that you have to plan on the strategy, you have to think uh, not only about the fast response, because you're fantastic in what you've achieved over nine months, but you have to start thinking about something that will give an effect in two or three days. Yes, maybe not tomorrow, but on the long-term perspective. So, Roman, we are all traumatized, and everyone, um, well, is has its own trauma. So, what to do with that? How do we... Uh, come closer to the victory with all these traumas that we've sustained. So how do we uh, target all this positive energy in the right direction? Uh, and what about the collective diagnosis? Uh, that would be too much, I believe. You know? Uh, everyone can 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 do something in order to do some some terms some some jobs you don't need to be a sane person so everyone has some 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 traumas and the whole civilization is built on on certain traumas and just a couple of words about the institutions i agree with this quote that a key uh, the uh, the root cause of the problem is all about the institutions, but I have a different viewpoint on why can't we establish institutions in that way. We've talked about institutions for 30 years. I was a young man when we started talking, and we keep, you know, we keep saying about these institutions, keep debating about them. But why do we still th speak about institutions? Because nobody can change by himself or herself. And we could change in a subjective environment. We could change uh, by having corporations or relations. We build the establishments or institutions based on the Western examples. But until now, until the beginning of the Western, uh, of this war, the Western world did not sort of host us or welcome us. They've set high standards but they were not giving us roadmap. And recently the Ukrainian authorities said, okay, we need to change, but how about we make a list of, I don't know, southern steps that we need to make. But that was never done because the Western world was afraid of Russia. So they were not leaving us behind, but at the same time, they were not inviting us to join themselves. And now we have this unique opportunity. We're not alone. This is a window of opportunities uh, that would exist for some time, and we will not use it. We will lose it. So for Ukrainians, it's, it's important to realize that, the, the, that it's all about the time. If we'll not use these resources, then we'll be left on our own with our problems. So my first uh, statement is you can't build an institution without being sort of inside the Western discourse. If you take a look at our neighbors, the Poland has completed building institutions, I think, seven or eight years after uh, becoming a member of the EU, Romania is still doing that. Bulgaria is still doing that. Croatia is still building its institutions. That is why I think that we have uh, setting for ourselves a very ambitious task, but we need to identify whether it's valid, it's reachable or not. I mean, a child cannot educate itself. There has to be some sort of relations. There has some sort of a connection. So in cooperation with these Western partners, we have to establish our institutions and procedures and traditions, and that takes time. And uh, that also takes a security environment. We have to be inside of a security environment. We've uh, had three revolutions 
and each and every of them was victorious. And every, uh, we are the winners of three revolutions, and we are facing the situation because our elite was too weak, and we couldn't join the Western world. It's maybe it's our weight is not not enough, because you know we have this chance to went out of this vicious circle. But that chance is as a brief one. So maybe it's it's months or or even less, and it will not understand our trajectory where we need to go if we'll not uh, start setting the real objectives then we will lose and how do we transform as the society do we need to transform or maybe we already got what we want to have well as soon as i start thinking that it's all good then in fact it's not because I, I have to be dissatisfied with the way I try, with the way I transformed, and I believe that after the end of this war, we will have a very significant challenge because we are now in the central uh, center of the world. People are talking about us. People want to cooperate with us after the victory. We'll be just an ordinary state, you know, semi-destroyed by this war, and we will have have to start, you know, teaching, to start learning how to write letter A, because we, having a victory in this war doesn't mean that we'll know how to build an independent court. So we'll have to remain uh, or to become a victorious, but still we'll need to learn more and more. Well, don't don't uh, hold on your, your microphone, please, please hold it. You've uh, mentioned the three revolutions, and there are people here who were on the spot during those revolutions, and many of the people uh, we have in this room participated in the Orange Revolution or the Revolution of Dignity. But you, you say that we pray all the time long. Now, what's that we still need in order to get this final victory? Now, what do we need to do to get this victory? Now, I'm not going to talk about this foreign enemy, but let's talk about ourselves. You've already started talking about this, but maybe you can elaborate. Look, I'm more of a psychoanalyst, so I know what has happened, but I don't know what's going to happen in the future. That's not a question to me. So uh, it's like a, an English uh, lane. You need to cut the grass for 100 years, and then after 100 years, you have an English lane. So we need to correct those values. Uh, we need to build the institutions, do not step out from these uh, principles uh, to be uh, sort of uncomfortable to hold uh, our own grounds, to continue doing that for maybe additional 100 years, and maybe we'll get somewhere close to Harvard. Well, if someone is feeling uncomfortable, then it, it's, it's all good. So I have a question to all of you, to all the panelists, just to remind you that uh, after this question, I'm ready to give the microphone to our audience. Uh, so let's let's get this question to our panelists first. We need to keep the president, MOD, general staff, CNSDU, and then uh, say goodbye to all the others to build all the institutions and agencies in you. Maybe uh, you can add anyone that about, about whom I forgot. And where we need to have this need, we'll need to establish, we need to build even more. Because the people tend to ask about the president, they tend to ask on when do we have ATB, that's the supermarket, when do we have Nova Posta, when do we have railroads. Uh, not sure whether railroad can operate without the ministry, but I think yes. Well, this pharmaceutical company, Darnitsa, it can operate without the ministry. You want to issue licenses, okay, you do so, but still do not interfere and every person would have a, a, a chance to get its own medicines or drugs. So not a single agency, public agency helps in that. So let us just identify what we need, where do we need this. If we won't be uh, satisfied with our uh, results, we'll crush it and start in you. And this lane 
it wasn't perfect on the second day. It, it has become perfect after 100 years of development. So, Professor Grisak, what prevents us from winning? Let me correct my statements. Uh, this, not the Ukrainian Catholic University in Sebastopol, because that's uh, not going to be appreciated, but but uh, all the uh, people, but maybe a Crimean tatter and Ukrainian university or Crimean university in Sebastopol, but their own university in uh, Lviv and just as ours university in Sebastopol. So that's going to be our dream. Yeah, I think this sort of conversation we could have back in 2001. 2001. I'm not talking about 1991 because we've already passed uh, a long way that we are not just capable of writing letter A, but solving a highly complex mathematical task. It's not about pride, but this recognition of the fact, because we wouldn't have such volunteers. We wouldn't have the soldiers as we have it, because Ukraine has become more mature, uh, has become more developed, and I believe that Ukraine is uh, even better than Europe. And it's not me who's saying that. Many people are saying that, because you. Uh, Ukraine is something that uh, many Europeans were dreaming of, uh, so we, we need to remember that. Just like a Murphy Law, everything that goes, it goes to the worth. If you think that it goes, it changes for the best, it's not, because there is this double in history, and the double can never uh, create anything. Uh, uh, just to, so this devil will spoil our victory, just as in case of the Orient Revolution. So we have to have this anti-devil security system, and I believe that many institutions are already functioning. I don't know uh, which which institutions should we add, because I'm I'm really afraid of this president, because he's good now, but what's going to happen after this uh, war? If he's got a lot of authority. And he has got a lot of uh, possibilities of running totalitarianism. It could be uh, like different types of totalitarianism, but uh, th this is not going to go uh, to do us any better. So we have this institution, and we have to identify which institutions are working, which are not. So there is one more aspect. We're very important for Ukraine Catholic University and for others. We are developing very good. We're developing fast, but there's a moment when we turn this quality into the resiliency. Because for 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 Oxford or for Harvard, the key term is 50 years. Only after 50 years that you can say that whether something has has been achieved or not. We're on the middle of this path, but we're going in the right direction, so to say. So uh, let me tell you what, in, where we do have the gaps. After the first revolution, after the second revolution, we were lacking the political project or a political party, a party of the motivated young people uh, who would have a political will and the knowledge to radically change the rules in this, game, in, in, in this country within a short period of time. So this is the rules in historic uh, history and economic. What the Balcerovich did in Poland, it's not an exclusion, it's a rule. Because the tactics of a turtle that you need to be, you know, slow but confident, that's stagnation. For countries like Ukraine, we can only jump into this development. So we need to have a, a leapfrog tactics, meaning when we jump, we jump into the development, but we never had things like that, because every time we had a president who said, we'll do that, but he never did that till the very end. So there are people who fight, there are people who support fighting, and maybe after the victory, we'll need to have the same division, those going for politics and those helping them, because we need to have a high quality political project. Uh, that who will not say that he will find Zelensky or prevent him from from spoiling. So I think it's all about creating a high quality political project, one, two, three, or many, to create a counterbalance. So there would be one or two several po or several parties that would be kind of competing against one another. And I had an interview with Serhii Felimonov. Uh, is a it was a famous person who fought against the construction projects in Kiev, who's now on the front lines. And he said that 
the army is fighting marvelous, it's, and Russia has no chance on the front line. But what's happening? There are some negative things happening that we don't want to discuss right now. There's toxic money on the front line. Some politicians are trying to help certain military units in return for, uh, well, the, they would participate in their political projects. And some money are not clean, are, are criminal, and they might be trying to build their own uh, personal armies. Because the more we understand the level of threat, and we have a high level of threat, the better we will we be able to regulate only those who will truly fear, only they will become, uh, well, popular and effective. Thank you. Miroslav. What prevents us from uh, becoming victorious? Well, first of all, what I would like to start off is that our defeats or retreats, whatever you call them, that's part of the schooling process. Yeah, the powerful parts uh, of it, uh, more powerful than victories. Yeah, in my life, uh, I learned more from uh, my losses and my mistakes rather than my victories. At some point of time, we would be able to evaluate the uh, value of those so-called uh, defeats, which were the God's way uh, to teach us, actually. The second thing is that the river in front of us could not be uh, leaped over in one jump. You need to jump from one stone onto another. And another image, uh, Maidan revolutions were steps for us, but we need to learn how to move uh, in a straight line on a flat surface. You cannot govern the country uh, using Maidans. Maidans are to help us avoid uh, the erroneous path. Uh, but we need to learn this calm and civilized uh, uh, way to develop and evolve. What prevents us uh, from achieving this is what we mentioned, lack of institutions or actually a slow pace of establishing such institutions. And as a result, for us, this results in excessive um, in personalization of the authorities and uh, the erroneous uh, functioning of social uh, lifts, uh, because the excessive personalization is an excess, uh, excessive attention to the uh, needs and preferences of the leader, and everybody is focusing on that while this erroneous functioning of the social lifts, for me, means that they select personnel based on his or her loyalty to the manager, uh, not uh, based on merit or talents or, if you will, um, integrity. That's why this uh, uh, social lifts practice uh, uh, works slowly and erroneously. But there is another important uh, consideration in the Ukrainian Catholic University. We need to uh, mention this. And in order to explain it better to you, let me uh, illustrate it with a metaphor. One episode from the history of the Soviet Union back in the 1970s, when the Soviet Union has opened uh, uh, towards trading with the West and started uh, procuring uh, industrial uh, production lines to start manufacturing various uh, uh, industrial products. But the West told us it's not enough for you to buy this uh, production line. You also need to buy the uh, materials that meet relevant standards. And our experts responded, oh, no, no, no. We can handle that ourselves. Just uh, uh, sell us the production line. But then using wrong materials, uh, the technological lines broke. And uh, these, these are money wastes it right there. Now, uh, the image that I promised, how to better understand the reasons for our lack of success. We are procuring at the West the institutions. We tried everything. 
uh, and invented everything, f starting from Verkhovna Rada. We have all the needed ministries in place. We have all the institutions out there. But why they are not working properly? Because of the wrong materials. Just pay attention to human material. Everything I'm telling you uh, was very relevant before the war. People in Ukraine, often enough, knowing about the values would set them aside because what they were mostly interested in are vested interests. So if the values stand in the way of vested interests, push them aside. But the war has changed things quite radically. And I can see this with the students I teach. They are ready to listen about, uh, about values. They are ready to talk about the values. They nod uh, in uh, affirming that uh, values are important to them. And we can change the situation. I believe in this, that we can finally uh, start using the material, the proper material uh, to allow the uh, technological lines to work properly. I believe in, into this. Thank you. Well, we can start with the questions from the audience uh, by raise of hands, please. Okay. Let's start with three questions, but uh, uh, please mention whom you're addressing your questions to. Wait for the mic. And while you're getting ready, I would like to remind our participants online that you can join us by uh, supporting the university. On your screen, you can see a QR code, and using it, you can donate to us either through our U.S. Foundation or the Canadian Foundation or uh, via our website. Uh, uh, in uh, English version in euros, uh, the Ukrainian version in grievous. Let's not forget why we are here today to support the uh, Ukrainian Catholic University. So the first question with the mic, because our friends in online would not be able to hear this question. The whole world is with us today. We're not on our own. Good, ev good evening. I'm Anton Shulik. Thank you for this very informative discussion. It's a pleasure being with you here today. I could not find the place in the first uh, three or five months of war. I couldn't feel myself uh, 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 comfortable. Then I moved from private business to work in a, uh, in a state institution. That's my friend, not in Kyiv. And then he uh, got enrolled into the armed forces. And I asked him, what's the role of the business? Of course, we earn money to donate some uh, more than others, some fewer than others. And he said, look, lots of social problems have emerged. And if you think that the people who work in those institutions would be able to resolve those problems, unfortunately, no. This is the person who joined the institutions from business. So what's your question? My question is this. How do you see the broader role of the entrepreneurs? Uh, do they need to become social? Uh, 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 social entrepreneurs resolving social issues, or uh, whom are you addressing this question to? To Miroslav Marinovich? Okay, Mr. Miroslav, this is your question. Now I'll pass the mic for the second question. Like I said, three questions and then we respond to them. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Igor Pavlyshevsky. My question is to all of the esteemed speakers, and it is this. Have you thought about the fact that the successful experience of the Catholic University could be uh, uh, scaled up uh, involving other universities in Ukraine. Which keys for transformations should we uh, select here? Or are you only thinking in terms of developing your own university? I, I can only hope that not. Okay, and our third question from the front row, Vitaly Koval. And then we'll have our answers. I am the governor of Rivna uh, Oblast, the institution that uh, Katerina has just uh, cancelled, ah, along with the parliament. Yeah. So my 
general reflection and the question to uh, those who are shaping the policy of the Ukrainian Catholic University. You talked a lot today about the institutions. Uh, well, previously we talked uh, as much about the values as the alumni of the uh, of your university. Uh, I would like uh, to disagree. You're saying saying that in the institutions are not working, but we remember growing people, growing companies, right? Institutions are uh, are all about people. Does the institution, the armed forces, uh, function before the February the 24th? All the polls show that the confidence to the armed forces uh, was uh, minor, and now uh, these are record-breaking uh, figures, and uh, our armed forces are creating the history. So my question is this such institutions as uh, the Ukrainian Catholic University, how they can help to reform such institutions as the public authorities and those uh, institutions that uh, are the skeleton of our statehood. How practically could we help to reform them? How to make the face of the authorities more civilized by impacting the people working those institutions. Uh, let me remind the first uh, question to Mr. Yaros Miroslav and Katia, uh, whether all the businesses should become social businesses and get involved in social projects. So the, this, this is the question to the two of you. What is the role of the business? Yeah. Okay. For me personally, the role of the business is first and foremost that the entrepreneurs are depriving the Ukrainian society of paternalistic uh, uh, habits because an entrepreneur is responsible for his own uh, um, status in the society, his fate, and uh, they feel natural there and it becomes attractive to others. People look at them and respectively got motivated uh, to do the same. It, it turns out that it's possible. You don't have to wait for uh, the happiness to be handed to you. You can uh, deliver yourself. The goal of post-Soviet Ukraine, such change and transformation becomes uh, paramountly important. So no paternalism. Okay, Katya. The question was about the entrepreneurs, and I would uh, differentiate business circles and entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are those who risk and that are fastly delivering on what is happening. All the advantages they go are delivered by uh, the entrepreneurs. We carried out a number of focus uh, groups uh, about volunteers, about uh, uh, charity activities and most of those volunteers are entrepreneurs. Uh, place second are uh, people who work in large business, who have uh, the uh, resources and time to help others. Uh, all the other categories are uh, fewer than the first two. I would not uh, want to make any conclusions and extrapolate it on the whole Ukraine, but uh, let me illustrate with a simple fact. Those who risk, those who take the responsibility, uh, they are the ones who make the changes happen. So those who want to become an entrepreneur, please do, and then we'll respond to the second question about the institutions. But if only we would free up those institutions, uh, would uh, those people uh, uh, transform into entrepreneurs? I don't know. Well, the second question will be addressed to Mr. Roman, how our university should uh, uh, scale up and uh, extend our experience to other uh, high learning institutions. And since you're here and you represent this university, well, somehow I have a feeling that uh, I have to respond to the questions to which I don't know the answer to. And in principle, uh, people know uh, less than they think they know, and uh, uh, we need to be tolerant to ambiguity in the time when things are changing so fast. I is it possible to extrapolate such experience? 
Truth be told, I don't know. I believe that becomes the result of a number of uh, circumstances that met in the same place in the same time, some uh, uh, Galicina region habits and the Catholic upbringing and some Lviv in environment. I don't know how can you uh, extrapolate that spirit to others. Well, probably that question should be asked to the rector, but, you know, like Mr. Yaroslav said, uh, Crimean Tata University in Sevastopol and in Odessa, they have their own unique cultural tradition in place, so probably the Ukrainian Catholic University uh, stems from our own tradition that before us there were people who built those institutions and we are the ones who learn from the um, walls of that tradition, like the third um, church, uh, the memory of such institutions that existed in the past and people uh, who know about this tradition, uh, they need to be involved. But again, like I said, I'm responding to the question that I know nothing about. I believe you responded beautifully. And the third question was about uh, uh, the civilized face of of the public institutions, the, uh, the question to Mr. Gritsak and Kat. Well, actually, Yaroslav allowed me to speak first because uh, you need to listen to a smart and decent person. My personal gods are uh, the armed forces of Ukraine, like for all of us, but the institution doesn't work because if it will be functioning, we would not be collecting uh, the, uh, donations for the um, to buy cars and the female servicemen, uh, service women would not be wearing uh, men's uh, underwear and we would not have to donate uh, water, food, of gas canisters uh, uh, and everything that has been brought in great quantities to the front line. So this institution doesn't work. I am not a great lo logistics expert, uh, and I cannot uh, estimate whether it's uh, not functioning for 50, 30, 10 percent. But those who uh, provide donations on a daily basis, probably they will be able to respond to this. And those uh, military administrations uh, in the villages at the front line well, probably they're doing something, and I suspect something good. If you read the Ukrainian Truth uh, newspaper, uh, but it's not uh, that visible uh, in the field. So the work of the institutions uh, should deliver the results where the focal point is. That's where the uh, greatest results should be generated. Probably, I suspect there might be some book crossing there and the administrations, probably some decent people, and I suspect they their English is more fuel, uh, fluent, but what uh, show me the results. People live in hardships still, and everything that uh, deals with the military that we are praying for, th these are the uh, results of uh, individuals rather than institutions. Mr. Yaroslav, I feel as if I'm going crazy because I feel that I know the answers to all of the questions. Yeah, for a long time probably now. Yeah, I probably uh, went crazy long ago, but now I recognize this. Well, I'm not saying anything uh, novel and new, but I translate the uh, other people's ideas. I read a lot and uh, I can uh, present myself as, as a smart person. Brychovetsky used to uh, say, and the quote is, uh, things will be great in Ukraine when the alumni of the Kiev Magyar Academy would be elected the president. So uh, only uh, I believe that the educational reform would be a success when uh, the new minister of education would be the alumni of the Ukrainian Catholic University. So why I'm talking about the Ukrainian Catholic University in Odessa, because the biggest university in Odessa is, belongs to Kivalov. And I might be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, 
It's Kevalov's university that generates most of the lawyers, and uh, for for a while we will have the alumni of the Kevalov Law School. Well, uh, one person likes this for some reason, applauds. But why I'm saying this? It's important that uh, we need to support the Catholic University because this university launched the uh, legal s school curriculum and we will start uh, uh, generating new lawyers and have the decent people, but uh, we need to grow them up. Uh, look, a great formula, the West is one thing and Ukraine is a different thing. Yeah, we are very much different. But again, uh, how can you claim that we should deliver Western reforms? It's like growing bananas in Siberia or uh, penguins in uh, Sahara Desert. It's impossible because you can grow bananas in Siberia if you build hothouses, greenhouses. You can uh, uh, also uh, have penguins in uh, Sahara Desert, but only in the zoos. But you you need to have the right farmers who know how to deliver this, uh, who uh, elect new political authorities through reforms. That's why I. Uh, it's great that you are the alumni of the uh, uh, Ukrainian Catholic University. That means that you don't have to be cancelled. So, I mean, nobody's going to cancel those institutions which are uh, under control of the graduates of uh, the Kiev Mohila University or the uh, Green Catholic University. We'll have time for two more questions. So why don't you raise your hand? Yaroslav Ruschishin and Irma Vitovska as our moderators. Um, I have a question to Yaroslav Ritsak uh, about the war. And I believe that Ukraine has not only uh, to gain victory in this war by liberating its territories, but to have a victory over its future. Because I tend to read those textbooks on history which are being uh, used, and we have to uh, gain this victory, and uh, we have to fight everywhere uh, in, to organize rock tables in order to correct the past, the Ukrainian past, which is well spread among the uh, Eastern uh, sort of uh, Europe. So I believe that our future is your vision on Ukraine having a constant platform with representatives of the opposition uh, minorities in Russia. Well, thank you. Now let's have a second question as well. Second question. I have a question to Yaroslav Taras Putichny, that's my name. Uh, you were talking about the youth in politics. Uh, uh, a lot of youth uh, came to politics uh, during the last elections. A lot of people were saying that we want to change. They had sparks in their eyes, but there's two statements. The business approach does not work in modern, or at least Ukrainian politics. And uh, a lot of them were crushed, so to say, and now there's this fear and, uh, okay, during the next elections, why should I go for politics without being afraid that I'll be a political dead man? Um, so, because those uh, studying in the Ukrainian Catholic University or Cape Mohila School, well, maybe there will be a, a politicians in in the next generation. But what about the the youth that is considering becoming a politics uh, and facing this chance of being harmed by? the existing politicians. So here we have uh, two questions to Yaroslav Ritsak, and I would like to ask the rest of the panelists to start thinking on their own key statement uh, as to finalize our, uh, our panel. Uh, so Yaroslav, uh, I gave you this chance to, you know, to think a bit. Thank you. I will never forget about it. Thank you. So I followed this example. There's this Ukrainian history, which is very good. And I think it's even the best, uh, and well, much better than the Russians. Now, that would never happen if uh, in diaspora, 
in North uh, America. They've created several institutions in Harvard, in Alberta, and some others, because they've done the, the work that allowed us to clear the path so that we would not be uh, having uh, a defeat in time. So I believe that we have to do that. I know that uh, can, there's a country in Kyrgyzstan, the Kyrgyzstan there watching at us just as we were watching in Poland. And there's this key group that uh, is still lacking its history, uh, Crimean Tatars. And uh, uh, still, the Crimean Tatars, they don't have their own history. There are several history textbooks wrote by uh, by someone, but not by those of the Crimean Tatars. They have to have their own school, better in Harvard. You know, if not in Harvard, then in Ukraine Catholic University. So I'd like to call upon the young uh, Crimean Tatar people. Where are your historians? Why are not en enrolled in this department? Because if you're not writing your history, someone will write this. So it's, it's very important to do that. And b besides, we have the experts in Ukraine. This is the best achievement because over the 30 years, we've got already the experts that we were developing back in 30 years ago. So the answer to your question is very simple. Fear is a normal feeling. It's a positive feeling. And in fact, we do a lot of things out of fear. And the, 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 the fact that we are fighting is that we are fearing of a defeat. And everyone has this fear. But it's not about this final terminal reaction. It has to be a primary reaction. Because in the very end, uh, if you're afraid, well, then you shouldn't be, you know, leaving this country. Or you can you can live in the West, but that's not going to be an exciting life. Uh, I had a graduate from Switzerland, and she kept saying that, well, it's so. Uh, well, so un unexciting to leave uh, in Switzerland, but she continues living in Switzerland, so she has this unexciting life. And there's this observation uh, that I have out of my experience of a professor, because I've been uh, teaching for 30 years and I have a lot of students. There is a very clear division. Those who want an unexciting life, he leaves uh, or he stays somewhere. But then there is one person out of 100,000 who becomes successful. Now, what uh, in Ukraine, you can be not one of out of 10,000 or 100,000, but one of 10. Now there's this window of opportunity for, for many people with an experience. And I believe that it's good that there's this group of people who went to politics and f there's this fuck up session that I kept saying, but there's this uh, number of reformers who went for politics who maybe failed, but now they have the experience and now they can turn this experience into a positive one. And then maybe there could be a second reproachment to, to the politics. The, the team that started during the first portion, I think that's the real uh, team already. Maybe they can establish a shadow governor, uh, government. Well, you, you out, so maybe you have to start anew, start for the third time, for the fourth time. There has to be this very clear principle, and I believe it's it's normal to be afraid. It's normal to have this feeling of fear. Uh, uh, Okay, so now I'd like to pass the floor to this final statement by our panelists. So, anything uh, you would offer as a summary, Katya? My social networks are filled with army, face, and uh, uh, language. So, my personal uh, statements. It's all about the university, the hospital, and the museum. So just as it was during the time of peace. I think it's very important. Well, hospital, you mean positively. Yes. I, I, you know, I kept forgetting uh, that a very experienced person is um, sitting close to me. He could give me my my own diagnosis. No, I won't give. I won't. I, I won't give you your, your own diagnosis. So my husband says that um, 
everything that we earn, it's good, and we have to invest either in hospitals or universities or in the museums. Should we interpret that uh, for the current days? We have the best university, Green Catholic University, so you can donate money for that or in support of that. And Sophia will tell how. Now, the hospital or the clinic, you need to think of that. And despite we have the owners of the Dubrovnik hospital, you need to think of what to do that in museum. Uh, then there's this world of uh, Skovoroda, and uh, we can do many things, not only with money, but with expressions, impressions. So there's this clinic, hospital, or this uh, museum. Oh, uh, this, I, I kept thinking what I, what I would like to add, what I have not mentioned yet. And I, I keep thinking of the recipes, why are we having these failures? And I, because this, the key myth for Ukraine, it's based on Varyaks. They were the one who came and we were there, but then came and they've done everything. Maybe we don't have the experience of a successful country, successful state. That means that we don't believe uh, in a country and in the authority. The person who mentioned about those politicians who were harmed. Now, what does that mean to go and join the authorities. That means that you're becoming a traitor because uh, the authorities are, are aliens, so to say, they came in and do something. And whenever we go for power, we're becoming traitors. We're not so poor people. We are becoming those worst sort of category of people. And I think that we have a unique opportunity now that we can uh, defeat these ideas of a heroic defeat because we can finally win. That's the first aspect. Second, we can develop a new tradition. We can have the authority in our hands, and this is our major objective for the society. We need to hold it, to grasp this authority and to control it, to become an ordinary Western nation. So out of this unique Ukrainian nation, we need to become a standard, traditional, Maybe a bit unexciting Western nation, okay? Oh, Miroslav, please, uh, um, your concluding remarks. Um, I'd like to um, recall uh, the words that I've uh, uh, earlier stated in these interviews, but my status as the former political prisoner, it gives me a moral right to repeat those words. More, what you can see today, what we can see together, many generation of fighters before us would like to see. And we can see that Ukraine is becoming liberated of all those uh, of all those foreign limitations and foreign restrictions, and we can see the end of the history of Russian Empire. I don't know how long will that process would take, but I've uh, came up with the statement that Ukraine is uh, shedding blood, but Russian Empire is reaching the final moments of its life. And that gives me some optimism, despite hearing every day this information about casualties, about uh, tragedies, about pain. And I'm convinced that we, all of us, have to find our own optimism in that. And I would like to conclude by yet another quote by the Metropolitan Dishpitsky. The key in transformation of Ukraine is inside of Ukraine. It's hard to change foreign circumstances, but we can change ourselves. And this is something that I would like to wish. So let us give a round of applause to thank Yaroslav Gritsu, Katarina Zahori, Roman Ketcher, and Miroslav Marinovich.